Um, hello everyone. See, the last class we discussed um, several types of costs associated with inflation. And this might lead you to believe that monetary policy should aim at targeting zero rate of inflation. However, it turns out that some economists argue in favor of, in favor of a moderate rate of inflation, maybe just 2% or 3% inflation rate per year. And they argue that there is one benefit of inflation, and that's what we're going to learn today. That's the first thing at least we're going to learn today. So what's the benefit of inflation? So the thing is, um, firms are reluctant to cut nominal wages, and the workers are also reluctant to accept such cuts in nominal wages because they see it as an insult uh, to them. That's why firms re nominal wages are rarely reduced by firms. And... That's a problem because sometimes the equilibrium real wage can fall, maybe due to changing economic conditions. For example, if there is a change in economic, economic condition which leads to an increase in the supply of labor or an increase in, uh, or a decrease in the demand for uh, labor, it might happen that the equilibrium real wage falls. So although the equilibrium real wage falls, the firms, on the other, other hand, cannot really uh, cut the nominal wage. So how can the fall in real wage uh, be sustained here? How can how can the firms achieve the fall in real wage when the non when the equilibrium wage has actually fallen? Equilibrium real wage has fallen. So th these things should be clear when we look at our graph. So the main point here is that because nominal wages cannot re cannot be cut or are really reduced. And uh, the no, but, but at the same time the equilibrium real real wage is falling. Uh, something needs to be done to make sure that the real wage is not stuck above equilibrium. Rather, it has brought down to the lower a new lower level of equilibrium. So what firms do is they actually increase the price level, okay, or they they just resort to inflation. So the so the mechanism that they resort to here is an in, increase in inflation or increase in price level. So inflation would bring the real real wage down here so let's have a look at the graph then it should be clear so here in this graph what we see is in the vertical axis we have real wage in the horizontal axis we have labor d1l is the demand for labor s1l is the supply of labor and the intersection point between them gives us the real uh real equilibrium wage RW1 and the initial equilibrium quantity of labor which is L1. Real wage as we learned in the last class is defined this way which is nominal wage divided by price level that gives us the real wage. Now suppose that the demand for labor falls and if the demand for labor falls then the demand curve for labor should shift to the left. If it shifts to the left we have a new equilibrium point right here so this new equilibrium point gives us a new equilibrium real wage, which is RW2, and the new new level of uh, new level of labor, which is L2. So L2 is the is, is the quantity of labor that firms will uh, firms are willing to hire at this moment. Okay, so L2 is what the firms can afford to hire. Now the problem is if the real wage if the equilibrium real wage falls to RW2, but the real wage is still stuck at RW1, then that's a problem. Why? Because at RW1, the number of workers that the firms can afford to, afford to hire is L3, which is even lower than L2. Okay? So the number of workers that the firms are willing to hire, or that they can afford to hire, if the real equilibrium wage is still stuck at if the real uh, real wage st still stuck at the equilibrium level RW1, then L3 is the number of workers the far that the firms can afford to hire. So there is a gap between L3 and L2, right? So L2 is higher than L3. That means there is going to be some unemployment if the real wage uh, it it remains stuck above the equi new equilibrium real wage, which, which is RW2. So the firms required that the real real wage it falls from RW1 to RW2 so that they attain the equilibrium the market equilibrium real wage RW2 so what can we do what the firms can do now is the firms they can increase the price level so if P goes up 
if P goes up, if there is inflation, then a nominal wage, because it is fixed, it cannot be reduced, because nominal wage is fixed and P is going up because firms they have increased their prices, this RW, real wage, must fall. If it's going down, that means we are coming to this new equilibrium RW2. Okay? And that's why this inflation is required, this small bit of inflation. Why? Because we want to we want to reduce a high higher unemployment because if the equilibrium wage was stuck at the initial initial level initial rate um, yeah initial level RW1 then the equilibrium then the equilibrium quant not the equilibrium quantity I would rather say the quantity of labor is L L3 but if real wage could be brought down to the equilibrium wage RW2 then employment would be L2 so unemployment would be uh, unemployment would be lower in this case instead of uh, the case where we have L3 the number of workers being hired now let's move on to hyperinflation so what is hyperinflation a very common definition is that if we have inflation over 50 percent per month that's what, how, that, that's what we call hyperinflation so what are the problems of hyperinflation well uh, the problems that you discussed before, the costs associated with the inflation, they just become huge under hyperinflation. So we have the same types of costs, but they are now more amplified than before. And uh, hyperinflation, due to hyperinflation, money loses its value, ceases to function as a store of value, and uh, people may conduct transactions with barter or stable foreign currency because money is just not worth... Uh, money is just not as worthy as it was before but there is one one problem of hyperinflation that I should mention here which is uh, the distortion in the tax system okay so what happens is in in, in a normal case when we, we don't have hyperinflation rather we have inflation okay at a moderate level what happens is there is a there is a delay between levying a tax income tax on someone and collecting the tax so Usually tax taxes are paid uh, every three months. Okay, although you have this income tax that you have to pay per month, the taxes are actually paid each, each uh, after after three months. So there is a gap between when the tax is levied on you and when you pay the tax. Okay, so if there is a, there is moderate inflation, then it doesn't really hurt the government much because suppose that this this is this is October and uh, you have to pay the tax for October, November, December and you should, the, 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 tax, the tax amount is usually paid in December okay after three months so if there is there's moderate inflation then it's not a problem because money doesn't lose its value doesn't really lose its value over time over these three months but if we have hyperinflation what happens is because there is a delay between uh, between the time when the tax is levied on your income and when you pay when you pay the taxes in December. By the time you pay the tax in December, uh, the amount of tax, the money that you're paying as tax, actually loses its value. Okay, it loses its value. That's a problem. That's that's how hyperinflation distorts the tax system. Okay, so you should you should uh, should understand this because. It's very important for the exam. Okay, let's move on. So, what causes hyperinflation? We know what are the co what are the costs of hyperinflation. I might be wondering how hyperinflation actually uh, gets created. So, we know that money if money supply increases, inflation increases too. Okay, so hyperinflation is is caused by excessive money supply growth. Okay. If we have excessive money supply growth, that leads to hyperinflation. So, why would there be an excessive money supply growth? The thing is that sometimes the governments, to spur the economic growth, they need to uh, raise funds. Okay, to spur the economic growth, they need funds. They usually raise those funds through taxes, but sometimes they just fail to raise taxes, uh, raise enough revenues through taxes, which can fund their expenditures. That's when these 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 governments or these governments resort to the central bank, and the central bank prints money for for the government. If the central bank keeps more and uh, keeps printing more and more money, the price level keeps increasing, 
and the final result is hyperinflation. Okay, so that's the case uh, with Zimbabwe, which happened, I guess, in uh, in 1990s, I guess, in 1990s. So there's a case study on hyperinflation uh, as regards to Zimbabwe. I think uh, this 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 problem started in the 1990s when the government Zimbabwean government instituted a series of land forms um, to to redistribute land from the white to to white minority to the Zimbabweans uh, to the black people the disenfranchised black population. Anyway, uh, you're suggested to read this read this case study because there is going to be a homework question on this. So a few examples of hyperinflation you can see here at the bottom Zimbabwe it had a period of hyperinflation over the period 2005 to 2007 and look at the CPI inflation in, uh, per, per year it's it's a uh, 5,316% per year that's that's horrible and even the money supply growth look at this the money supply growth was pretty high too so money, we know that money supply growth money and money supply growth and inflation rate they are correlated if money supply growth is higher inflation rate is higher too so why governments creating the hyperinflation we already talked about it uh, when the government cannot raise taxes or sell bonds it must finance spending uh, by printing money so how to solve this problem of hyperinflation well the solution to hyperinflation is just stop printing money. If you stop printing money, inflation stops. But this is not really a painless process, rather it's a pretty painful process. Um, for example, interwar Germany, when it was faced with hyperinflation, uh, it went through a painful process of DI hyperinflation. It wanted to uh, get rid of the hyperinflation, so what they did is they cut at least one third of their workforce in the government. Uh, just to make sure that the government expenditure is uh, is not is not too high. Okay, let's move on to the classical dichotomy now. It's again a review thing. You have seen this thing before in your introductory macroeconomics. We know how the real variables are uh, defined. They're they're measured in physical units. Okay, for example, real wage. How do you interpret real wage? Real wage is is uh, is a number is a number of outputs that you receive for working. Maybe if the real wage is six breads per hour, that basically means that if you work an hour, you receive six breads as your as your wage. Nominal wage is just say six dollars or seven dollars per hour. Nominal variables are measured in money units. For example, nominal wage, nominal interest rate. Um, things like that that the if you understand this then the classical dichotomy should be clear to you so the classical dichotomy says that there is a theoretical separation of real and nominal variables in a classical model uh, in other words nominal variables do not affect real variables uh, for example if there is money supply if the money supply increases in the long run it's not going to have any impact on your output okay because output is a real variable here and the money is a nominal variable here, supply money is a nominal variable here. So a related concept is the neutrality of money. Changes in the money supply do not affect real variables, which I just mentioned. In the real world, money is approximately neutral in the long run, but in the short run, money supply, in changes in money supply can affect uh, the output growth. Okay, that, I guess, finishes our uh, chapter 5. We'll move on to unemployment, which is chapter 7 on uh, Monday, and finish that chapter, I hope, uh, this week. Alright, thank you for watching this video.